Welcome to Oaken Bros. I'm Eric. And I'm Michael. And today we have an incredibly important and special guest, uh, an author, a playwright, a screenwriter, actor. actor. And today is like, is an amazing anniversary. I want to introduce Marty Casella. Is it Martin or Marty? Martin's my professional name. But yeah, but we could say Marty, right? Because you're Marty, Marty to us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So today is the 38th anniversary of, what was that the first film you were in? That was the first film I was in. Yes, it was the anniversary of the release. Of, of Poltergeist. Okay, Marty was in Poltergeist. Go ahead, guys, Eric. Yeah, you guys know the scene where the guy... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 Marty, you know, Marty, why the Marty, fuck am I you... saying this? <laughs> like, Marty should tell us about the scene and what can you like can you recreate it like uh, I know. I'm sure yeah my kids, my, my, when I made the movie I was also a school teacher and I after the movie came out I would go to school to teach the kids and they all yell at me rip off your face rip off your face <laughs> so I have a scene in the movie where I have a hallucination that I am actually ripping off my face because the house hates me so much because I doubt that the house has power so I go into a bathroom after throwing up and I look in a mirror and I I, I love, there's like a little tear in my skin and then I pick at it a couple times and then all of a sudden I go crazy and start just going like this and clawing at it. And my face basically falls in the sink in big chunks. And then there's Amazing. a flash, a light pop. And then they cut back to me and everything's perfectly fine. And I have to say, I, I, I've been an actor on and off since I was a teenager. And um, that's my thing. That's the moment I'm absolutely the most proud of in any acting I've ever it's done. Iconic. It's, it's iconic. It's iconic. Yeah, well, and, and that cut back, because when we shot that, we hadn't shot the face pulling off scene. So right. I was having to respond to something that I had no idea how it was going to look. So, um, and then that look back when I just kind of just look in the mirror and go, wow. And yeah, when I saw it at the, when we, when we did the looping of it, uh, <laughs> Oh, and they showed it to me. And that was in the old days where you had to go into a giant screening room and the giant, huge screen. And they had 50 people in the sound booth and you had to watch it and do, they do the, well, they still do the clicks, I think. But right, I mean, you right. have to loop all the, the dialogue or that, or in my case, the heavy breathing. And when I saw it, I just burst out laughing. And I couldn't <laughs> stop. Amazing. Yeah. And they, they, said, they said, what's so funny? And I said, oh my God, everyone's going to remember this scene. So, so how did you get to that? It's, like, it's a very, very long story. Let's, let's just say that after I got out of college, I had studied acting for four years. I went to CalArts, which is a school that the Disney's created and funded. And um, I loved my first three years. The fourth year, I had a little problem. And when I graduated, uh, I thought, I don't want to act anymore. So I went to work. My dad offered me a job. And I worked on Spielberg's movie, 1941, in the transportation wow, wow. department. And the office I worked with my dad in was right next to Spielberg's office. He couldn't go into his office without me seeing him. And so I got introduced to him the first or second day at work. And then Kathleen Kennedy and I, who, you know, she now she runs Star Wars World, um, Lucasfilm. Oh my God. And she and I sat, she, she and I started work the same day. And, um, and it got to the point where she and I were sitting, sitting about five feet from each other. And um, we got to be very good friends. And I sort of moved up. And when they finished the main part of the shooting of 1941, I became Steven's assistant on the set. And, and from there on, he said, I want you to be a part of my team. And I, I worked for Bob Zemeckis when we had a little break from Spielberg. But Spielberg produced Used Cars, which is a fantastic movie for anybody out there who hasn't seen it. It is a great classic comedy from the 1980s and uh, late 19, uh, 1970s and uh, with Kurt Russell. And I worked on that and Stephen would come visit and he, one day he showed up and he said, okay, uh, we're starting work on Raiders of the Lost Ark in a month. So I worked on that for a year with him as his assistant. And then I quit because I wanted to go back to being a writer, which is something I had done earlier. And I wanted to go back to being an actor again. And- um, I have a question, Marty, if you don't mind. Yeah. No. It's not every day we get to interview somebody that has been worked so closely with somebody like Steven Spielberg, and, and that's amazing. So, like, I guess my question would be, what's it like working for him? And, like, what's, like, one of the biggest things that you learned or a takeaway or, or, or anything like that? Because, I mean, he's so influential. Yes. Oh, and, and when I met him, 
he had just come off of uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which was a gigantic hit and an incredibly influential film. Mm -hmm. And the things that I learned from him over the two and a half or three years that I worked with him were um, how unbelievably kind he is, how unbelievably focused he is, how I've never seen anybody better prepared ever on any film shoot I've ever worked on. And the other thing I lear learned from him was that he liked having people around, specifically one person who later went on to run Lucasfilm, who would say, are you sure that's a good idea? Or um, would sort of maybe laugh and go, oh, I don't know about that. And Stephen was always really open to that. And, and he really listened and he always, always had the absolute best people around him. Uh, and we see that now in the last, you know, the, all of the movies that he's made in the last 45 years. Um, he surrounded himself with, he with surrounded smart himself with the smartest. I mean, and, and because he's kind and he listens um, and he cares, he cares about the world. I mean, he funded the Shoah project. I mean, he cares about so many things and he has a real life, you know, now, you know, he has like eight kids and, he goes to all their stuff and now, you know, most of them are grown now and everything. And he's a great, he's a wonderful grandfather. And um, yeah, he just, he was always really, really present. And, and, um, and he paid attention to everybody, you know, and he was kind. And, amazing. And, and if you later on ask me about his kindness, a, a very specific example of it. Um, so what happened was I quit. And I went back to acting and I got a role in, like, a week later, I got a role in a play in Los Angeles that I got great reviews for. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe I do want to do this. And one day I got a phone call from Mike Fenton's office. I'd known him from Raiders and, and a woman who worked with him, Marcy Liroff. It was Fenton Feinberg casting. And they said, oh, Stephen wants you to come in and read for a role in Poltergeist. And I was there when Poltergeist was written. The, the two writers, Mike, the Mike, two Mikes, and I was there when, you know, when E.T. was being written and. Wow. And I must say like the magic of that is like, I couldn't imagine anyone else playing that part. Like that, well, that it was you. Like it was, that, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing that was so odd was when they called me in the original script, they were, and this is Steven again, um, because it's Steven's idea. He wrote the original draft and then to Mike, Victor and Mike or whatever, they came in and, and, um, but this is how, this is how prescient Stephen was, and this is very important in terms of what's going on in the world this second, is that Stephen said, you'll notice the, who the real leads are in the film. It's three really, really strong women and a really strong yep. girl, daughter. Yep. The women are so important in that movie. Yes. And the men are kind of, the dad's kind of funny and wonderful and dopey. And the two assistants were originally written, one was supposed to be African American and the other one was Asian American. And they, they just couldn't, it was, it was 1970, 1980, 81, and they just couldn't find anybody that they liked. So they, his, his and the character was actually named after a famous uh, Japanese American cinematographer, Tak Fuj, Tak Fujimoto, I think it is. He worked for Jonathan Demi all the time. And they named the character after him. And, and so they called me in and I, the funny thing was when I went to go read, they put me on video uh, tape for Steven, I knew what was happening in the scene. And then I'd always say, oh, what am I going to, you know, oh, what's going to happen? They're giving me a sides when I get there, you know, before fax machines and stuff. And I practiced yelling in the car on the 405 in LA, in my car, oh my driving God. to the audition. Because I knew that's, I knew that there was something like that that was going to happen. And I got there and they handed me the sides. And yeah, it was exactly that, where I had to breathe heavily and scream and pretend to, you know, rip off my face. And, and, and so I did it. And <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> Because I'd known my, Mike Fenton for a while at that point and Marcy, and they both looked at me and they're like, well, you're kind of a good actor. And I said, well, that's what I went to school for. That's what I did before I became, you know, this, the, as I used to jokingly say, the, the assistant to the most famous movie director in the world at that point. So, um, it was. Except, maybe, except maybe for George Lucas. So, um, and my, my friends always used to tease me because they'd say, oh, tell us a story. And I would say, Stephen. And, and then they would, they would tease me for that. And sort of give me crap. Right. Like, oh, your name dropper. I'm like, it's the man I work for. What am I supposed to call him? You know, Mr. Spielberg. Anyway, as an example of the kindness 
we, so we'd already shot Raiders. I le left working for him. We, we, we shot Poltergeist. And, uh, well, I'll, I'm going to move it back just a little bit. So yeah, right. um, I auditioned. I didn't hear anything for months. I, I just sort of assumed I, I hadn't gotten it. And, and Kathy, I think, uh, called me and said, we're having a the first private screening of Raiders. There's only going to be a few of us there and like three Paramount executives. But Stephen asked that you be there because you are wow. a part of it every single step of the way. And he really wants you there with us when, when everybody sees it for the first it's time. Incredible. It was incredible. I was so moved. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then it got better. So they told me the time. They said, be there at Paramount at seven o'clock. It's the big screening room, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay. And uh, I, I had been doing this play and, you know, and, and things were going well. And I parked there and there were no cars there outside the screening room. No one was there. And I mm -hmm. thought I made a mistake, like nobody's here. And all of a sudden I saw this Porsche, I think a friend of mine who, was, who know, heard all these stories, he always says it was a Porsche spider. But uh, this amazing Porsche came roaring through the parking lot and pulled up. And we had a joke at Lucasfilm when we were prepping and working on Raiders was that when Steven would call from his car phone and go, oh, I'm three blocks away. And this was in, what, 1980, 81, when the right. car phones, they're like in funny movies where you see them and they're the size of a shoebox. And, uh, right. and so we had a, there was a valet parking guy at Lucasfilm. And usually he would go out, and, but on some mornings, Somebody would say to me, oh, the valet guy hasn't gotten here yet. That valet guy went on to be one of the most gigantic, hugest, most gigantic producers in Hollywood. And so I would say, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy named Ian Bryce, who oh my produced God, yeah, all yeah. the Transformer movies. Yeah. Produced <laughs> Saving and Private he started Ryan. out as valet. He was the valet guy. And then he worked his way up to, to be a PA. And then, um, yeah. And I've just recently gotten in contact with his wife and she's like, Oh, Ian can't wait to see you. So this is, oh it's like amazing. God. So that morning, I, oh, there would be mornings where I had to go out and Steven would pull up in the car right up to the door. He'd jump out, he would toss me the keys and then he would go inside and I'd have to go park the spider somewhere. So the, we're at Paramount and this beautiful car that, you know, everyone wants and he pulls this spider up and he gets out and without even looking at me, he just tossed the keys to me as if go park my car. <laughs> I burst out laughing and I said, excuse me, Mr. Spielberg, I don't do that anymore. You know, and he goes, who are you? And I said, I'm great. I oh, said, I'm doing really well. I said, where is everybody? Um, I, I, did I come at the wrong time? He goes, no, 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 you're here at the right time. And I said, okay. <laughs> and he said, hey, Kathy tells me you're doing really great. She said, you're doing, you're in a play. You got great reviews. Like in the LA times, you got singled out in the review. I said, yeah, yeah. And um, he said, and I hear you're doing a movie. And I said, what? Kathy told you that? Uh, and he goes, yeah, I heard you're doing a really big movie for somebody famous. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, Steven. And he goes, you're going to be in Poltergeist, dingo. You know, he's like, oh my God. He you in it last week. And I wanted to personally tell you. So I asked you to come a half an hour early so you and I could have a little time together. Oh my God. At which point, like the faucet started and I was just, because that had been my dream since probably I was 10 years old and I'd go to movies, like five movies every week. That's, That's me. What I, you know, yep. you know, yep. Yep. you yep. know, and I just stood there in the parking lot at Paramount and that was way back when the giant 10 commandments, giant blue backdrop where they faked the, you know, crossing of the red sea. And I'm standing there in the Paramount gates, like 10 feet away from us. And I just sat there and I, and all I could think of was that, you know, there were things that he and I didn't agree on or whatever, but I just thought that's, and that, mo that was the moment where I sort of made a vow. And I, you know, I've had phone calls over the years from, you know, people writing books, magazine articles, and if it's a good thing, I'll talk. But I say to them off, off camera, you know, off the record, right off the bat, I said, if you're, I always say, if you're asking me to say anything negative about Steven, I won't. I just won't do it. And, and, I, yep. and I have very little negative to say. So, so what that. happened after uh, Poltergeist? Were you, were you in any other movies or you just went more I was, like I, was in some other, I was in some other movies. Um, what hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Your dad was in History of the World Part 1. My dad was. He plays a Viking in History yes. of the World Part 1. <laughs> and you want to know? Credits. 
Yes, yes. And my dad, for anybody who's watching and listening, my dad's not an actor, but my dad is a teamster and it, well, he was. Now he's now he's retired, but he was the teamster and then he was. Big shout out to Paul Casella. Hi, Paul. Yes. We um, miss you. We we'll, love you. We'll make sure he listens to this. Please. And, um, Thank Paulie. Yeah. And he started when he worked at Fox in the mid 60s to the late 1960s and early 70s. Um, he would do little things like he'd come home and he went, oh, I beat up Cato today. Like they, oh I'm a big God. guy and they asked me to, on the set of the Green Hornet TV series, they pulled me over and said, here, will you do this? And he gets, he still gets SAG checks. He gets SAG oh screeners at SAG award times from also from history of the world. And, and the, my favorite thing he ever did in a movie was we were shooting a movie called Gator with Burt Reynolds down in Georgia. And the actor Jack Warden was in it and he played a cop and he became, he becomes friends with Burt Reynolds in the movie. And he, he's in a hospital and he ha they, ha they get him to escape from a mental hospital, something. And Jack Warden was wearing a hospital gown that was kind of open in the back. And Jack Warden couldn't do this stunt where he had to jump in like through a window of a car, an open door of a car and Burt Reynolds took off. I'm Italian, I wave my hands around. Um, so my dad did it. And my dad, you can see in this movie Gator, you see Jack, not, it's not Jack Warden, Jack Weston. So Jack Weston okay. runs down this hallway, camera, right toward the camera, and then there's a cut, and then you see this guy in the same hospital gown running down a sidewalk, and he leaps into the back of a car. And the back of his gown opens up, and the, the fun of it is, is that, you know, the giant white moon shot going on there. And that's my dad. Do you have that? Do you have I, that? I don't have it. It might be on YouTube somewhere, but I know it's in the movie Gator, which is easily found. But I love that. I mean, that is he, fascinating. Yeah, he did all sorts of little things like that. Sometimes they would ask him in movies because he's an amazing driver. I know you guys have yes. heard all those stories. Just for the, the listener's background, we're yes. our, our, the Oaken family and the Casella family are our best friends. We, we, we're, yeah. we're family. You know, yes. and uh, Eric parents, and my youth, Eric our, and my youth yeah. was defined by the Casellas. Yeah, Every, our parents yeah. and Paul and Connie, who are your parents. Well, uh, you know, the, it's yeah, yeah. it's a little it gets a little complicated. But for us, it's it's Paul and Connie, and right. and um, Shirley too. We're gonna Shirley, Shirley right. in this yeah. too. And um, and we just we just grew up together, and yeah. uh, and they were our West Coast family, and we would meet we would meet halfway in Vegas, and right? It, and it was just our, part our East Coast family. And right. we went to bar mitzvahs and weddings. And my yeah. favorite photo of all time is you two and my two nephews standing in a photo shot. It's a, it's a photo place, but the two of you standing in a thing with like a bear trying to get you. And yes. the, the so was City Walk. <laughs> that was like 1994 <laughs> yeah. City Walk. Eric, I have a lot of echo on my mic. Do you hear me? You're, you guys, I, can you hear me okay? I, I hear you fine. There's okay, a little Eric. bit of an echo. Okay. You guys want me to put a headset on? Would that help maybe? Possibly. If do you have one or no? I do. I had one right here just in case. Let's Stand see if it works. It. Hold on. Because I, 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 I have the big gamer. I have the big gamer headset. Yeah, like that's that. much better. Yeah, oh god. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, okay. That's what I figured. Yeah. I, okay. That's okay. why. That's why I asked before. No, I'm not you a gamer. gamer right? do you, no. Do you gamer. play video games? Do you don't play video games at all, right? No. 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 I think I've only ever seen like my godson up in Palo Alto. I spent a couple weeks before Christmas up there and he played video games and that's that's the only time I've actually seen anybody play one where like you kill lots of people and yes you know yeah, yeah. so but, um so yeah our families we, we, we were just incredibly close and like it's just Uncle Paul and 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 yeah. it, yeah. like the the affection that we have for each other and there was just an instant connection and yeah. um and we like to it, eat. It was, we like to drink we like to gamble I mean like that that was pretty much it yeah yeah, and, yeah it was a nice that party and yeah. you, your family came to plays when I would have a play yes, down on the paper my, moon. I wanted to bring up paper I wanted moon. to bring up Paper Moon. That was yeah. such a defining moment because like my theme for my bar mitzvah was Broadway shows. I right? was there. <laughs> I know. And like and then like Paper Moon was like a Broadway show. And yeah. like, you know, I loved Broadway when I was a kid. And um and then just being there and then meeting that little that that little kid that was the star of the show. Eric, right. you remember left, that? Of course I do. She, it, oh, it was yeah. it was it left such a mark that like she she was so young and so little, but oh. she was she was like forty five years old. But yeah. she, like, like oh, in yeah. her in her mind, the in way that mind. she spoke, like she was so she was so polished, and that that just left such. a – I don't remember how old I was, Michael. What year? What year was Paper Moon? What year did Paper that Moon was, come out? You, you guys went up. You guys went up to Connecticut. Connecticut. That was right. probably yeah. ninety seven. 
My bar, was was 90, my bar mitzvah was 96. And your mitzvah was 96. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no, I still, I still have the t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> and, Do you have the boxer and, and, shorts? Do you have the boxer shorts? I don't shorts? have the boxer shorts. I, and up Marty, until very recently, I still had the sunglasses that we all got. Marty, I have to tell you something. Tomorrow is one year away from my son's bar mitzvah. I can't believe one, that. One, June 5th, 2021. Oh I don't want, gosh. I don't want this to be like a Jewy podcast, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like my son's bar mitzvah is he's turning 13 next year, which is just mine. I like, think we, I think we might all have to fly out there for that. You know, I mean, I'm hoping you guys are going to come out. It's yeah. going to be like a big and, party weekend, but, and there can be a giant blizzard, like on the night of, uh, Eric's you bar mitzvah, that? where, You're... where the, my entire family was stuck at, except me. Cause I lived in New York. My entire family was stuck at, uh, at uh, JFK airport. And then at your house, yep. because yeah. it was, no it was plate, the best, no... there was one of the best times of my life life of, oh, of my amazing. of my youth of just all the casellas in my in my parents house and yeah. it was it was just a food orgy and it yeah. was just non-stop food yeah. and just laughs and movies and playing poker oh, yeah. and and playing with the kids it, it it was just it was such a ryan memorable... and garrett ryan and garrett who are marty's n- nephews they they're they're like cousins to eric and me yeah. i mean you know you they i still we talk Yep. As much as we can. I yes. know we're all living separate oh. lives, but we still keep in touch. And it's I, been. I can't tell you how many times a week my sister will say, oh, I just talked to Michael. Yeah. Melinda. Yeah. Specifically yeah. Melinda. And, and then I know both of them, both of my sisters talk to your mom all the yep. time. Yes. Yeah. So, Michelle and um, Melinda. And, and I can't yeah. leave out Matt. Your yeah. brother, Matt, I would love to get him on a podcast. I don't think yeah. he would. I, I say good luck to that. So yeah. I don't my, think my brothers, would. my brother's a very quiet, uh, private person. And yep. And nobody thinks this, but he's actually very shy. So well, um, give, a, give, a, give like a little tidbit on what Matt did. Can, are you allowed to say anything? Uh, I can say what Matt did. Yeah. Well, he's been on my, TV. It's, he has it's, been yeah. on TV. He's interviewed. I can say all that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My brother, when he was 19, he became the, 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 how he started, he was a theater director. At the age of 19, he was the youngest person ever nominated for an LA Drama Critics Circle Award for a play when he was 19. And, in the, and after that, he went on to be nominated about three other more times. He directed his first off-Broadway play when he was 24. Um, and then he, he directed just stuff everywhere, all over. And he was a genius director. And then he got involved with casting on television and for films because he always had a great eye for casting. I mean, just as a, a little paper moon tangent, when we had the open call for the Broadway production of Paper Moon, which for those of you counting, we, we, we did it out of town and then uh, some things came up and we didn't uh, actually end up opening, but we had a Broadway level cast and four of the guys in our ensemble that we got through open calls, all four of those guys who were in the ensemble of our show, 25 years later, all went on to be Tony nominees for various <sighs> Broadway shows. My brother has one of the most incredible eyes ever. And my well, who, did I mean, just, just, who did he find? Who did he find? Who did he find? Who did he find? No, who, did he find? Who, who did he the, hand the, pick out of Kansas? The, yeah, <laughs> the play, the payoff for the story about my brother and his amazing talent to prepare you all is that my brother was a ca- was one of the big major casting directors, if not the major one, for the new Mickey Mouse Club in the early 1990s. And my brother discovered Christina Aguilera. Uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, what's her name? Oops, I did it again. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Ryan Gosling, yeah. who, who still, who? yeah, who? Ryan Gosling, like, like three-time Oscar nominee, Ryan Gosling, right. who still in every interview says, I only have my job in Hollywood now because of the guy who discovered me when I was 11. Matt Casella. Doing- Time out. I have to tell you, Ryan Gosling got the Wolfman, Eric, for the next Monster Universe at oh, Universal. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, I just saw that yesterday. You haven't lived until you've seen a 10-year-old Ryan Gosling, my brother has the videotape, doing an imitation of Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca. He's unbelievable. He is, he's unbelievable. That's why he's Ryan Gosling. And <laughs> Carrie, Carrie Russell. And um, also, he Justin, also, wasn't Justin, Justin, Timberlake, Justin, Timberlake. Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake, who Matt still goes to his concerts and yep. sits in a special box. And, uh, and um, a, one of the other boy band guys, I can't remember who it is. Maybe J.C. Chazé. Yeah. I think he's also. And during those auditions, before they became famous, the people he has on tape uh, that didn't get chosen, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, 
Yes. Oh uh, one of my favorite pieces of videotape of all time is my brother asking Ben Affleck if he has any acting experience. And I think he's like 14 going, well, I played, I played the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. He was, um, ben Affleck was in a, a, a school video about whaling. I don't remember what that was, but if I remember correctly, Matt c- casted that because Ben Affleck was a kid. Yeah, he, oh, was a, yeah. he was a nobody. The whaling yeah. adventure. Do you remember what I'm talking I about? I don't. Right? That I don't know. About, I have to find so. that out because he was. I remember Ben Affleck was in this like it was like a school thing that we had to watch in school about whaling, and I, I'll find yeah, yeah. that out. And if, I if mean, you, I'll, I'll ask him about that. He has everything. He owns he all those videotapes, and they're amazing to watch. I mean, it's incredible. honestly, oh, like who, the two, the two of you need like a Netflix documentary. I mean, like this is <laughs> well, these stories, the, like not the, everybody has the, these stories. The thing that's so odd is that I have friends who tease me and I, and I, you guys know me, I'm kind of, I sometimes most of the time I'm a pretty modest person, but, and it's, and, if, and I got called out on it recently. It's like, come on, talk about this stuff, you know? And a friend of mine teased me recently and she said, she said, you are like Zelig. Every time I bring up something from the 70s or the 80s, it's like, wait, because I, 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 I had been telling her a story about when uh, Melissa Matheson, late Melissa yeah. Matheson, one of the great screenwriters of all time, um, she was uh, dating Harrison Ford at, when we were making Raiders. And um, she had written The Black Stallion, which is classic, great kids movie that's also a great movie for adults. And Stephen had seen it and he fell in love with it. And they were looking for a writer for ET and Melissa came to, she was just coming to visit Harrison in, in Africa. And I was there, Stephen called me and said, Oh, can you come help us and carry their luggage and all that? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And I was in the hallway carrying luggage with Harrison and you know, who I knew and mm-hmm. worked with for a year and, and Melissa and Kathy was there. And I, uh, and I think Frank was there as well. Frank Marshall, Kathy's mm-hmm. co-producing partner. And um, I have his autograph, by the way, on an arachnophobia he's, poster. He's, he's the absolute best. Both yes. of them are. They're both yes. incredible people. And, um, and it's like a scene out of a movie. We're walking down the hallway and Kathy's going, talk to her, talk to her. And, and as we get to this big you know, suite at, at the Sahara Palace Hotel in the middle of Tunisia, um, Stephen turned to Melissa and said, uh, oh, there's this kid's movie I want to tell you about. At which point they walked through the door and just vanished into the other room. And I remember it as clear as a bell. And, I, and I'm standing there with luggage in my hand going, oh, he's going to pitch E.T. to her now. Oh, that was, my God. He'd been wanting to do it. And, <laughs> and friends of mine said, it's like, you making this up? And I'm like, no. One of the nights we were in London, because we shot all the interiors of Raider. People, people always seem amazed at this, but the rolling ball, the – the place in the in the, in Nepal where Marion's bar is, those right. were all sets on a gigantic soundstage. And um, really, yeah. And and there were only about six of us that were there: uh, Kathy Frank, me, Harrison, Howard Kazanjan, the producer, um, and Karen Allen, and the costume designer. And most, like, we had a little group of all the Americans in London for the three months we were there. And, and Stephen would often say, you know, he's a very gregarious guy. And he'd say, let's, let's just all go out to dinner. And I, I, there was one night where he had become enraptured with the actress Judy Davis, who at that point had just, oh, she, there was a movie, she, an Australian film she was in, and I can't remember which one it was, but she was, un, she was like worldwide famous. It just catapulted her to, you know, international stardom. And it turned mm-hmm. out she was like somewhere, and she just finished playing Edith off so Stephen somehow got her at this dinner we were all at at a restaurant that Michael Caine owned in London and this woman with her hair was all chopped off and that she he somehow managed to track her down and all of a sudden I was sitting at a table with all these other people you know and like Michael Caine walks over and and, oh and, and Stephen was like saying to you know to, to Judy Davis oh tell me you know tell me all about that making of that film and 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 it's so funny because when you grow up in Los Angeles I came from a movie and family. I mean, both of my sisters, my brother, one of my uncles, my two closest cousins, uh, my dad, my stepmother, um, all of us, all of us worked in the film or television industry or theater. And um, that kind of stuff, like when I was a kid, I was so like starry eyed. And I'd say to my dad, oh, you know, what movie are you shooting at the studio? What's going on? And he's like, I'm bored. I don't want to talk about that. That's boring. Yep. 
you know. I and, remember walking into your dad's office when he was running the back lot at Sony. Yeah. And I, I've been writing screenplays since I've known you. I mean, since I'm like 14, 15 years old. <laughs> yes. yes. I, screenplay, I, you know, nothing's ever been made, but I've had a lot of producers read them. And then I transitioned into books. But like your dad, there was like eight productions going on in the lot. And he's like, Michael, you know, Paul, is it Michael? Yeah. Like, see that shelf? I'm like, yeah, just a stacks of screenplays. He's like, they're yours. I'm like, what? It was Groundhog's Day. <laughs> It yeah. was God. It was Godzilla. Yep. 1999. And I, I, I took those home and they were nothing like the movie, nothing at all. And I still nothing. have them. And, and reading these scripts, it was, the, you don't realize how influential, I don't realize how influential the Casella family has been on me, my writing personally. You have been my guru when it came <laughs> to writing. Why did you, why did you choose to do writing? Um, what was, what was your passion? Was it a choice of acting or writing? Like, it was, yeah, when I was a kid, I loved, I loved going to the movies. I love movies. Uh, I didn't really see a real play until I was like maybe 15 or something. And of course, you guys, you guys know I'm kind of a little bit of a political activist. And a little it's bit. So funny on Twitter, bit. on Twitter all day, all I see <laughs> all is yeah, these it's lights. me. And uh, yeah, and uh, and when I was a kid, the very first play I saw, first professional play I saw, is uh, was a play called The Trial of the Catonsville Nine about a group of priests and people in a Catholic church in Maryland who went into Washington DC to protest the Vietnam war. And they, they poured blood all over the steps of you know, the Supreme court building. That was the first play I saw when I was 14. So, you know, those things affect you when you're a kid. So I had started writing a play when I was probably 12 or 13 because I was a kind of a voracious reader. I just loved everything. I was obsessed with F Scott Fitzgerald and because uh, I just think he's just, you know, for his time, he's just like the most American writer. The Great Gatsby is the American story, you 100%. know, and and um, and I, when I was 14, I decided I was going to write a play that was all about uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda. And and it was all and I took in famous incidents from their lives and then sort of strung them all together in this story and I did all this research about them like they were on the set of the original Ben-Hur in Rome when it was being shot so that was kind of an interesting thing and their relationship and friendship with uh with Ernest Hemingway and so that's when I started writing plays and then I was heartbroken sorry I gotta no worries scratch my uh, my nose and I was heartbroken because I had this finished play it was all done when I was 15 I was so proud of it and somehow something happened and, I, and the entire play got lost. It went missing. And we wow. tore through trash cans. I even, I even asked my mom to take me to the, you know, the garbage dump. I was like, that's my one play. And back then you didn't make copies of things. It was on a type, you know, banged out on a typewriter. And that's when I realized I love doing this. And I had won some play, oh, I won some awards when I was a kid for poems that I wrote and mm -hmm. um, got published in the local library magazine and things. So. I always wanted to do that. And I wanted to be a writer. So you followed your you followed your passion. I did. I did. I I come from that school of you know following your dream, follow your passion. There you know all those internet memes about you know find the thing you love and make it your work. You know, right. and you if know, you do what you love, it's, it's not it's, it's not truth. work. It's, exactly. Right. When you do what you love, it's not work. And and the great great lyric. I mean, there's lots of great Sondheim lyrics. But the one that always stays with me is, is my favorite musical is Sunday in the Park with George. And because it's about a creator, it's about a guy who creates and how it affects his whole life. And the person in that play that the musical that teaches him the best lesson is the spirit of his great, great grandmother who comes back to him. And she sings this lyric about it. The, the trick to life is not so much do what you like, but like what you do. And that's stayed with me forever since I heard that. And so, you know, I, when I started acting again, I started writing and how I got into writing plays and how that exploded was when I came back from working uh, in London, I, I got to live there, which was had, all, in addition to being an actor and a writer and being in a movie, my dream was to live in London. I'm a total Anglophile. And mm -hmm. um, I got to live there for three months. I brought we my were opening. Up. We were opening BLS of London 
a, a couple months before COVID, mom, oh. Eric, and I were going to London. We were going to do this big oh. press release. Like we were, you know, like London was going to be our big thing. And then COVID happened and we had to put it on the back burner. But yeah. we're, we're still, you know, we're still into it. But yeah, really? no, London. Yeah, is, well, London, uh, London is, well, I know you guys. It's, you guys appreciate those things, you know. Absolutely. And, and to get to live there and, and I brought my bike with me and on, we had <laughs> – Let's just say the American team was surprised that a couple of them were disappointed because they were thinking in the beginning, the producers, the Lucasfilm people that, oh, well, we're going on location. So we'll shoot six days a week. And what they realized was, no, the mo- <laughs> we were, <laughs> they were working in their hometown. So mm-hmm. we only worked five days a week. And it was also a big surprise for Steven when he found out that, oh, at five o'clock every day, uh, we don't, we don't, back in 1980, they did not have overtime. They did not believe in overtime. Mm-hmm. And at five o'clock, basically, no matter what was going on, the AD would yell, wrap, that's a wrap. Wow. And so they had, they worked out something with the crew that if they were right in the middle of something, the crew could vote to go another 15 minutes to like to finish the shot. Is, is filming a nine to five job? Like if you're filming a scene, like, no, not at all. No, okay. not at all. Right. Not at all. And um, I have no idea what it's like there now, but that's what it was like then. And at four o'clock every afternoon, I hope this, it's still like this. I doubt that it is because, you know, 1980 was when things, that's kind of like the world, that's when the world really began. So many new things came along. And, right. But at four o'clock every day, um, the, tea, the, tea, the tea trolley came to the, to the, into the uh, studio and into the studio, coffee studio and stage. Coffee and donuts here. Yeah, tea, coffee tea and, and donuts. Crumpets. But yeah. literally, a tea trolley came in at four o'clock, where a lady would pour people tea in, you know, china <laughs> cups, and we had scones. So, where? What are you doing today? Or like, you know, I've no, I've no, you, lots. you produce lots of plays, and that's I did. I it's yeah, I, I, I've had the last my one big play that's been done all over the world is called The Irish Curse. Uh, it's about a bunch of Irish American guys who are in a group therapy session in New York. And, uh, it's been done everywhere from Sri Lanka to, uh, Rio de Janeiro to London to, um, how did you so come up how with did, yeah, How did you, how'd you come up with that? Like what? Okay. What? Uh, uh, you're, you're, okay. Ita- you're Italian. Like, like yeah. what? Like, come on. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, and what, when is, I the, first what moved, is the Irish curve? Okay. For anybody who's not from Boston, Philadelphia, New York, or Chicago, uh, there is this weird uh, old wives' tale slash b- belief that that and trust me, I interviewed enough Irish American guys to, uh, on when I was doing the research. Um, they have this weird belief that they have small penises. That <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've first ever time, first th- first time ever on Oakham Bros. Yeah, those words have ever been those uttered. Words have ever yeah. been yeah. spoken. Yeah. Well, apparently they were spoken. In the Senate at a Senate hearing yesterday too, somebody actually used the word penis. So, um, really, so Great. we're in good com- we're in good company. Anyway, I was <laughs> nothing political, nothing political, nothing no, political we're... at all, ever. No, no, never. And um, I, I was very bipartisan. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so let's ju- let's just say I was walking down the street with somebody, uh, and this person was an actor, and we walked past another actor on the street. And after we passed by, I heard the words, he's got the Irish curse. And it was a guy with a, a name like O'Malley or, right. yeah. So I turned to him and I went, oh, does he have a drinking problem? And he said, no, little penis. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's oh, utterly man. ridiculous. And then I got schooled basically. And, and I don't, I want a little caveat here. I don't believe it exists. I have to say this at every talk back, every interview. It's everything. a joke. Yeah. It's well, it's it's the joke and that the guys in the play believe it's true. Okay? That's that's my brilliant. My yes. And um and and for some reason, as my a wonderful Australian friend of mine said, she said, You've written all these incredibly funny moving plays and and political pieces and tragedies and lovely comedies and it's a play about wee willies that made your reputation all over the world oh my god so um and i actually am working with two producers right now they want to develop the play into uh, a tv pilot oh wow uh, all right yeah and they've already had a meeting at netflix about it and 
we it's amazing marty yeah of so, course it's i mean amazing. listen if that doesn't get made into a tv show then what can yeah right, you know what exactly. i mean like that of course that's going to happen yeah and the other thing that's happened with that play in the last year was i had two theater artistic directors approach me and um say hey we love this play um would you mind making a an inclusive version of this and i was like what and two separate producers on opposite sides of the country who didn't know each other said, could you put two men of color in the play? And I, I went, it's I, kind I of have, not the Irish curse. Right. But I had to think about it. And then I thought at, to quote that, that my favorite line ever from the book of Mormon, it's a metaphor. Um, <laughs> and I thought about it. And while I was thinking about it, I got contacted by this theater in Sri Lanka which for anybody who doesn't know where Sri Lanka is, it's off the coast of India. And um, they were going to do a production of, of the Irish curse. And they sent me photos <laughs> and it was five Sri Lankan guys who anybody who doesn't know, they're, they're very dark skin. Um, yes. They are people of color. And, yep. and they were playing my five Irish American guys with Yankee t-shirts on. And it was a huge success there. That's incredible. And all of a sudden, I thought, wait a minute. If that can happen, you know what? Why not? So I did a little research. I, I made some calls. I talked to, to some people. And after a while, I did a, a the th one theater guy who actually said, if I like it, I'll commit to doing it in my next season. And I said, fantastic. So I took an entire month off with phone calls from him every once in a while. And I'm saying, don't take it apart. Don't wreck it. I only want you to change like 5%. That's mm -hmm. what your goal is. But you have to acknowledge those two characters and what's going on in their lives. And so I did that. And with help from the other artistic director who suggests, she's a woman, she wants to do it. She suggested, she said, since both of these ethnicities have stereotypes about their genitalia, Mm -hmm. um, we want, we would like it if one of the guys was African American and one of the guys was Asian. And I said, okay. And when I finished it, both of them were thrilled. Both artistic directors were thrilled with it. The one guy outside of Chicago and he has a theater there, they committed to doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my agent sent it to, to Samuel French, which is now called something else, Concord. And they wrote back and said, we love this. We think we can get it produced oh, in other wow. places. And they are publishing a second version of the play called Irish Curse 2.0 oh and which God. is or they call it the, the the diverse curse and um yeah and it's i That's i and unbelievable, I, Marty. it's unbelievable and i and i'm very happy in this theater uh outside of chicago when theater comes back it could be a year from now whenever um they've already committed to doing it in their next you ever season. think about You've, doing a excuse yeah. me mike do you ever think about writing a book called the irish curse or is that is that out or no, I think there's, you can go, if you go online and look around and there's a lot of stuff. And, and the thing that was so, one of the things that was so crazy, Eric, was that when we did it off-Broadway, uh, the off-Broadway production, um, one of the nights afterwards, this guy came up to me and he said, oh, are you Marty? Did you write the play? And I said, yeah, hi, hi. And um, he said, uh, are you aware that the Gay and Lesbian Center in Manhattan actually has a group like this? And I said, oh my God. I said, honestly, sir, honestly, uh, full disclosure, I did not know that until three weeks ago when our publicity started going out and somebody sent me a text about that. And he said, yeah. And I said, is it okay? Are you offended or anything? And he said, no. As a matter of fact, I'm bringing the entire group next Saturday. Oh I've, <laughs> I've been texting them during the show Incredible. saying, you know, and they came. Two weeks later, like 15 guys came and we had a talk back that night and five of the guys came up and, and sat with our actors and talked back with the audience. So are you, well, hold, are on, you Eric, hold on, you asked the last question. All right, all right, all right, last right, question. Right, right, right. I have to ask this, screenwriting or playwriting? They're Is very, they very, they're very different. I love doing both. Um, what, when, my, when my first big, big play was produced in LA, um, and then I had another one produced and then I got, you know, and I, the second one, the famous film director, John Milius, came to see it because it was about my experiences working on 1941, very thinly sure. fictionalized. And John came and saw it. 
there was a character in it that was sort of based half on John and half on Steven that the audience, you never, he showed up in the, in the second act and he was kind of like the deus ex machina for what happens. And, uh, and, and I didn't go the night when I found out he was going to beat her that night. I just went, no, John's going to punch me out. He's going to be so angry. And the d director called me that night. And he said, boy, did you make a mistake? He came backstage. He loved it. He was hugging everybody. Wow. Um, he said, yeah, you should have been here <laughs> instead of at home cowering under your bed. And the next day, John Milius called me and said, could you come over to uh, Warner Brothers this afternoon and have lunch with me? I have a project I want to talk to you about. And I had lunch with him. And by the end of the lunch, he had committed to basically me. He, he sent me out and he said, he said, what's your favorite movie? And I said, Chinatown. And at that point, Chinatown was only about eight years old. And he said, uh, he said, go find me a great L.A. story like Chinatown. And I spent two months doing research and I came across the Doheny murder, which is an incredible story. Mm -hmm. And um, did you know, and, fact, Bob Doheny, Robert Doheny, um, There Will Be Blood, which is my favorite movie of all time. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's based Daniel on. Daniel Plainview is yes, based on Bob based Doheny. based on yes. Doheny. Yes. Yes. And, yes. Yes. And well, they're both. Or it's, you got to watch Ariel America. Okay. I yeah. learned that on Ariel America. I think and there, and know, they were and the and the Dohinis were also hugely involved in the um, Teapot Dome scandal yes. of the 1920s. Yes. And um, the government, the United States government, basically without doing bidding or anything, just gave gave them a bunch of land that they knew had oil on it. Um, yeah. So anyway, and and I I came up with that. I went back to John. I said it's an incredible story. Um, <laughs> And he said, great, let's go pitch it to the boss at the studio. And I had never pitched anything in my life. And, I, and, and, and John didn't help me because when I told him the story, he goes, oh, that's great. Just go in there with that excitement and tell him the story. So I worked it all out and I went in there. <laughs> and the head of the studio was there with like four lieutenants taking notes. And I didn't know. And I had no idea. And I took 40 minutes to pitch the story because it was a thriller and it was incredibly complex. Right. And at the end, the head of the studio looked at me and he goes, wow, that's an amazing story. And I said, well, great. Thank you. Uh, and he, he, goes, he turned to John and he goes, John, we're going to talk about this. And um, we're really excited. Uh, thanks. And we got outside and John Milius grabbed me by the lapels and he pushed me against the door. And he said, what the hell did you just do? Didn't you know that pitches take like eight minutes? And I said, John, I've never <laughs> pitched anything anymore. And then he called me three days later and he said, well, dopey, they bought it. So, wow. um, yeah, and they never made it. But, um, and that led to, I got, I got a, uh, I got a, and a friend of mine was at a big agency. She got me in. I used the, 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 I, w I worked almost a year at the studio writing that movie. It was called Coastline, very mm -hmm. LA, very Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I wrote a spec script about some kids, kind of like Goonies, I guess who discover a lost opera of Mozart's and it's this sort of gigantic action adventure movie. You can't see it, but behind me, there's my Goonies Never Say Die there you license go. plate. That's right. Yep. That's Goonies. Right. You know what's you know you know like kind of disheartening is that like you're telling me these stories and they never saw the light of day. Yeah. And like how many others are there that, uh, that are so- Millions. In, that millions. millions. That what, how do you take rejection? That sucks you, right. you, after, you just keep, you move on. Onto the, you go okay and then you move on to the next one and, but then like you and, have like dude where's my car being made and then yeah, like exactly you know what and, i mean and like well eric the thing that was really hard and i i have to work it's it's a it's a it's a job not being bitter and not being jaded you know right. because and and trust me guys the 1980s the top gun and all those movies and hey they're great great popcorn movies and, and i love mm -hmm. them all but those aren't the kind of movies that I personally would kind of write. So right. the 80s, it was hard to be a screenwriter in LA in the 80s if you wanted to write serious dramas, right. uh, especially a young guy that, you know, and um, yeah, and, and I, uh, that script, nobody liked it except one agent at my agency and he sent it to Dan Petrie Jr. who wrote Beverly Hills Cop at Disney and Dan called me in and said, I love this. I, I, I can't understand why nobody else likes it. And, um, you know, and so many things I sold or got bought that never saw the light of day. You, you wrote Tom's dad, right? Yeah. I wrote a few years ago. Is, yeah. As, is, is, has any, I read that. No, no. About it's, right. it's about, yeah, it's about my favorite script. Uh, I wrote it. I, I, yeah. I, I sold it to two Hollywood producers, a husband and wife team. Um, they've had, 
Oscar nominated directors attached. They've had Oscar yep. nominated actors attached. They they just couldn't get it set up anywhere. So they couldn't get it set up hard with 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 Lassa Holstrom and oh. Will Farrow attached. They couldn't get it set up. Hugh when, Jackman. Hugh, I saw as Hugh Jackman. And I pitched. I just over and over and over again said to them, guys, Hugh Jackson. Jackson can get this made. He's a song right. and dance guy. Right. Come on. And last year they they came out of the woodwork again and they're they're good people. They they hired me for three different movies. I mean, they hired me for another a, a novel adaptation that they own the rights to and I did an I did an adaptation and they had Herb Ross attached. Like, you know, Oscar I'm nominated doing that. director. I'm doing that for this right now. I I got yeah. um I I I fired my agent. All right? out of I, I it was it was it was she she was she was, it was Mike, Michael's right? most Hollywood moment so far. It, right, right. <laughs> my most Hollywood moment so far is when I had to fire my my film agent because no, there was nothing. nothing. It was nothing. It was like, okay, what do you got this week? It's like, you know, yeah. well, I'm still waiting. Oh, yeah. And she did get the book. Monsterland has been optioned. And so then I was pushed by my entertainment attorney, Susan Grode, um, uh, who's who, her son, um, her son, Josh, is running Legendary out of all places. Like this is like very That's prominent, fa- yeah, prominent family in LA. And I got her on a cold call out of all places. Um, she, uh, she introduced me to John Levin and John Levin, who is. He's a, he's a manager. He was this mega agent at CAA, mm-hmm. and he did he he packaged Hook, he packaged Shrek. I mean, this is like the, he reps Chris Hemsworth. I mean, this is like he, he reps Thor. Okay, like yeah, I, yeah. I don't think you're much of a Marvel guy, but like. So then she introduced me. I told him all of my books that I'm writing and everything, and they're all published. And he he signed me, and now he got he's in the process of getting a Nickel Fellowship Award winner to write the screenplay for Monsterland. So it's like, you know, I sure, you know, but like that's literally your hands are tied though. They're tied. They're totally completely tied. You you have no control in Hollywood. No, you you don't. You just have no control. Even, I mean, I, I, the, the story that I always, that I go back to it and it's ultimately has a happy ending for this team. But you know, the movie, the movie Moneyball, which had Oscar winner, directors attached with an Oscar winning screenplay writer, Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill in like one of his yeah, best and Jonah Hill in one of his right. best performances ever. And it was entirely what they the studio pulled the plug a week before they were going to start shooting principal photography and everybody scurried and they found I forget who ended up releasing it, but you know, they had to they they caught I think yeah, Paramount, right? And I but so. uh, I think it was Fox. Fox like canceled it on a Friday. They did that for Home Alone. They did that. Yeah. They, they did that for Home Alone, where they they Warner Brothers stopped production in the middle, and then Fox. John Hughes had this whole yeah. big thing where where he 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 had Fox pick it up the next day. That they yeah. Warner Brothers went over budget the, and everything. The, uh, the the Netflix show called The Movies That Made Us. Yes. Oh, and, that. yeah. And awesome. It yeah. was it was they did Die Hard and uh, and they can't you can't. That's why you know everybody in Hollywood their go to expression is Will, uh, William Goldman's No One Knows Anything. Because oh, I live by that, Marty. No he, one knows anything. Yes. The, the executives, I was there. The executives at Universal thought E.T. was going to be a kid's movie that they would have to work really hard to sell to get kids to go see. And it ended up, but well, for whatever, how many ever years it I just was, want to the highest grossing movie. Of, yes, and probably one of the greatest movies ever made. I just want to mention, Eric, we have we have another call after this. You do. So I just yeah. want I, this is Marty Casella part one. I mean, <laughs> I, I want to hear no Marty. Like I, I have a thousand other questions that I have to ask like, you. I don't think we even scratch the surface. Eric, do you agree? I mean, yeah, like, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's so interesting and it's such it's such a unique. I want to know view. how you got like you how you got an agent like like you know. I'd do, be happy to tell you all those things. Yeah, yeah. like I, there's so like th- this was like a part one of like maybe like a seven part series like the, the, <laughs> the marty, so funny. marty, the marty Kisella Kisella yeah. chronicles but you know? but it's the thing just to finish with you guys for today anyway is that yes. you nobody does know anything you know yeah, and right. then when a movie's successful if it stars a woman they go so. oh yeah or they'll go oh that was a fluke i mean my right. my favorite fluke of all time was when they made driving miss daisy into a movie that's a gorgeous beautiful little movie right. and 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 afterwards, everybody was like, look, that, 
That movie made $200 million yep. back in 1989. People will go see this. And the studio Absolutely. heads all went, it's a fluke. It's a fluke. They, no it, it's lightning, lightning in a bottle. It'll never happen again. No so you just, you just have to keep going. You know, maybe the next one. Maybe. Uh, Mark, would you ever one. consider starting your own podcast? Would you ever want um, to do something like this? You because like have, because you have access to such amazing individuals <laughs> that that you work with, and, and you're just so like, you're, in like the you're playwright, so fascinating. In, you're no, so but like in the in the playwright, like you know, oh, oh area, you know what I mean? Like you can interview that. I think for your community that you yeah. that you really you could support, be the voice, Marty. You could really, really have a great podcast. I'm telling you, and well, and such amazing stories, inspirational. It's you know what I I I, I love what I do. You guys kind of nailed that earlier. It's you do, you do have to love what you do and you have to, you have to believe in it. And Mm -hmm. you know, every once in a while you get to a point, you go, maybe I can't write, maybe I'm terrible. Maybe this all was a fluke because like when you, when you put it all together and you say, yeah, I've written probably and been paid for 25 movies, you know, Mm -hmm. over a certain period of time or, and TV pilots, I sold a pilot to HBO, never got Mm -hmm. made. And, 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 but after a while you finally, that little voice inside you just goes, well, I must be good at something because right. they keep hiring me. Right. And I have friends who made entire careers working in Hollywood, doing rewrites, selling spec scripts, and, and um, you know, that never got made. Right. And, that's, and an yet, amazing, that's an amazing documentary. It about is all, an amazing about documentary. All the things that never, all the got, things made. That never got made. Yeah. Marty, where can, our, where can our listeners find you? Get Twitter, Instagram? Uh, like uh, yeah. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I think it's M. Casella Writer uh, on, on Instagram. And it's the same on Twitter. Yeah, look and, up Marty on Twitter. He's got a lot to say. Yeah, I do have a lot yes. to say. Especially about the current administration. <laughs> 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 yeah, and mind you, this is June third, June fourth, June fourth, when okay. when the world is literally burning <laughs> in um, the middle of the apocalypse. But okay. you know what else? I have to say that yes, I do. But as but as my agent said the other day to me on the phone when we were talking about a new project, which maybe I'd be able to tell you guys about, um, she said to me, and I, and I was really grateful. She said, I have a thing every day that I post photographs of photographs stills, film clips, movie posters of beautiful things, the pe- things that make our life better. And she said, going to, to your pictures every day and looking at things has helped so much. Being quarantined, being, you know, yep. having riots, having flu yep. that can kill you. And, um, and those things are really important to me too. So yeah. unfortunately we have we to have go, to Marty. Go. Marty, thank you. Minute. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. So Eric's yeah, going to end I'm, recording. Gonna, hey, everyone, yeah. like, subscribe, leave comments down below. Follow Marty, please. This man is like, he's my personal writing guru. Okay. All right. right. Everything I know today is because of Marty. We love you all. Peace out. Peace out, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Marty.